In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is the day that the Lord has made. I love it. That was what the epistle said today. Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice, right? This is, this is what St. Paul's method, uh, message is to us uh, very often, to, to uh, find that place where we can rejoice in Christ, where we can rejoice in the Lord. And, and if you've been around, you know, uh, Orthodox Christians, especially if you've been around Christians that are going into Holy Week, they're, you know, and going into Lent, the ones that really, uh, you know, take this um, time uh, and really grab it uh, by both hands, you know, th there's a rejoicing. There is a rejoicing during this period of time. And it, and it seems a little strange to say that because we know at the end of this week, well, I mean, at the tail end of this week, there's the resurrection. But as I've repeated, the best we can do is, is die. So at the end of our road is the, is, the, is the crucifixion, right? We know at the end of this, at the end of all of this rejoicing, at the end of all of this triumphant entry, at the end of all of whatever we have to do this week, we know that, that as much as we are rejoicing today, seeing the Lord enter Jerusalem triumphantly, he is going to be lifted up by his own words, by his own admission to his apostles, when they were rejoicing over the fact that the demons were subject in his name, he was saying to them, hey, hey, the Son of Man's going to be lifted up, but not the way you think. He's not going to be exalted, at least not, not, earth, not in an earth way, but in a heavenly way he's going to be exalted. And, and so we're, we're in this place where, where we're rejoicing today, but we've got, we've got one foot in the rejoicing, but we're leaning already. We're leaning already into a darker and more solemn uh, understanding of what this week is going to represent for us. And, you know, as, I, as my uh, priest growing up, you would always say to, to, to his congregation, and I repeat almost every year, if the only time you've ever seen the church is where myself or Deacon Michael are wearing kind of brighter colored and more festive vestments or there's gold on the altar or gold out here, you know, and you have not seen, and the lights are bright, if you've not seen the, the darker side of the church where there are uh, uh, solemn, very solemn services that take place where the lights are dimmer, where the vestments are purple, where everything, if you've not seen this, if you've not seen this, then take the opportunity this year to find that place. Because what happens during this period of time is unlike anything else. Jesus Christ never, except now, really universally experienced the praise and honor due to his name. He got it a little bit uh, with the kings and with the shepherds and with the angels at his birth. But then he fell into worldly obscurity and no one knew him. And even when he went to his own town and started to preach there, they wanted to stone him. They didn't like what he was saying because he's like, hey, hey, hey the, the, the scriptures are fulfilled and they didn't like that. And, they want, and, 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 you know, he said a prophet's never going to be uh, exalted, uh, you know, accepted in his own country. So none of these things were really universally making him exalted until he raised Lazarus from the dead. And it was at that point that the people who did not have anything to gain by, by announcing Christ as the Messiah, they saw it. They, uh, they saw it, and they were proclaiming him Hosanna, which is, the, which is the word that is given to praise to God and to God's representative, the king. This is what happened when the king would come back. They would, they would uh, proclaim Hosanna. They would take their, their branches of victory. You know, because the king would come back from battle and, and he would be uh, victorious and they would say, hey, Hosanna, God is with us. This is how, this is, this is to be praised. And they would, they would uh, bow in front of the king, not in worship, but just out of respect because he was God's representative to them. He had been the Christos, the anointed one. That's what that means, the Messiah, Christos. That's, those words are the same. It just means the one that is anointed by God to rule 
the people of Israel. And so when that happened, this beautiful, wonderful thing took place that we kind of like, kind of sort of gloss over a little bit. And you see it in the icon. You see it in the icon, you know, so you have, you don't really see the, the oh no, you see the victory, the, the symbols of victory in the, in the, the hands of the, the two individuals on the right, and then you see the apostles behind him and Christ's blessing as he's, as he's kind of like humbled on a donkey. He's not on a horse, which is what, you know, is a symbol of war, right? If you're on a horse, you're a general, which is a symbol of war. If you're on a donkey, it means the fight's over. That's what, that's what it means. And Christ came on a donkey, which means the fight's over. Everyone says it's humble, and it is humble. The donkey is a very humble animal, hot head to the ground. But Christ was not going to war. He wasn't. The war was already over. And so his triumphant entry back on this beast of burden is, sim is, is symbolically shown by the symbols of victory, but there's this other person right underneath him. This little person, and you see it in all the icons. You will see it in every single icon. There will be at least one individual that is taking their coat off and placing it on the ground beneath Christ. And this was another uh, manifestation of what took place when a king would return. They would, instead of placing themselves on the ground in, in homage, they would take something of theirs and put it on the ground and basically say, we, we thank you for keeping us safe. It was another way, it was another symbol of victory that they would place their, themselves and their belongings and entrust themselves to the king. But it's an interesting thought that we go through in this period of time, especially this period of time, uh, uh, as we're entering Holy Week. What is it, beloved? What is the thing that we are going to lay down this week for Christ? What is it? What is the difficult thing? Because these garments weren't all, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of clothes. You know, this, they, were, they were placing on the ground the very thing that they owned. The thing that they wore, and when they were coming out to see the king, they were decked out because they wanted to be impressive. So they were wearing nice things and laying them on the dirty ground to, look, to go beneath the king. What are we laying down, beloved? Are we laying down a bit of our time? Are we laying down a bit of our, you know, anxiety maybe? Are we laying down a bit of our anger? Are we laying down a bit of our judge, a judgmental nature? What is it that we're laying down? We have to find that thing within our own hearts. And we place it at the feet of Christ, not just as he arrives victorious in the, triumphal, in, in the triumphant entry that he has into, into uh, Jerusalem, but we, every single Sunday, place our worries and our cares and we lay them down right here. Right here. And we're going to have that opportunity to physically do that this week as this icon comes out on Thursday night for us to venerate. We all need to lay something down. We all do. And if we say we have nothing to lay down to Christ, we're fooling ourselves. There's something. We just have to find it. There's worries. There's cares. There's grudges. There's pain. It's not ours. It belongs to him. He wants it. He's asking us for it. And when he receives it, beloved, he just, he takes it. He takes it, and when we receive it back, it's never the same. It's always better. If you've not had the experience of laying something down before the feet of Christ, this is, a, this is, an, this is a, uh, an exhortation by the church. 
Let's do this. And not on Friday night, just. Not on Saturday night, not just on Friday and Saturday night when we come in droves to, to experience these beautiful services. I'm not telling you, don't come. Please still come. But on Thursday night, Thursday night, when that icon of, of Christ is brought out in front of everyone, let's take those moments. Let's take the, those moments to embrace and, and touch and kiss the feet of Christ as we lay down our cares. Not to pick them back up, but to give them to Christ who will perfect them and free us from the worries that are associated with them. It's a beautiful week, beloved. Let us take advantage of all of it. And if you're, and if you're normally coming to Thursday, then come because we got services the whole week, morning and evening. So let's take advantage of it as we walk step by step to Christ. And as we begin the process of laying down ourselves before him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. May the blessing of the Lord and his mercy come upon you through his divine grace and love always, now, and forever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to your God, glory to you. May he who <coughs> condescended to sit upon the colt of a donkey for our salvation, Christ, our true God, through the intercessions of his all-immaculate and all-blameless Holy Mother, by the power of the precious and life-giving cross, the protection of the honorable bodiless powers of heaven, supplication of the honorable glorious prophet and forerunner John the Baptist, the holy, glorious, praiseworthy apostle, the holy, glorious, triumphant martyrs of our righteous and God-bearing fathers, of our Father among the saints, John Christus, the Archbishop of Constantinople, whose liturgy we celebrate, holy, righteous ancestors of God, Joachim and Anna, and of all the saints. May the Lord have mercy on us and save us, for he is a good and merciful God who loves mankind. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. May the Holy Trinity bless, protect, and keep all of you. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, uh, we have uh, a beautiful, oh, we have another uh, parish council member today. God bless him. Thank God. <laughs> Hello, Alex. God bless you, man. Um, we, uh, we have um, the joy of having uh, such a beautiful and wonderful week. As I said before, um, there will be uh, if you're not a person that likes to go to church in the evening, it's okay. We have church every morning too. So we will have, uh, we'll have church starting tonight uh, for those darker services that I was talking about. 6 6.30 every night this week, except for Thursday. Thursday's a little bit longer, so it starts at 6 o'clock instead of 6.30. Um, so it'll be uh, 6 o'clock every week. There should be uh, schedules out on the Pangati for you to take so you so you know which ones they are. Every single morning, there will be divine liturgy except for Friday. 
Divine Liturgy every single morning. That actually started on Friday. Last, yesterday was Saturday. La, the Friday was pre-sanctified liturgy. Saturday of Lazarus. Today, tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday, there will be pre-sanctified liturgies. Thursday will be the Mystical Supper, the uh, Vesperal Liturgy of St. Basil. Friday won't be liturgy, but it will be uh, the service of the hours. Saturday, of course, uh, the, the first uh, Anastasi service that we do in the morning. And then, you know, we kind of go through. Keep in mind that, um, that there will be um, unction on Wednesday afternoon. The, the, the sacrament of holy unction will be performed Wednesday afternoon. And after that, after that service, Wednesday night, Thursday, Thursday night, Friday morning, Friday afternoon, Friday night, Saturday morning. It doesn't make a difference. Pull me aside. I will anoint anyone that missed Wednesday. I will, anyone that missed Wednesday afternoon, I will anoint anybody that would like to receive Holy Unction. If you did not already receive it that day, I will anoint you. It's fine. Um, so, but Wednesday afternoon is when we are going to take the oil and make it Holy Unction. And any service after that, I will uh, anoint anyone that comes. So you don't, I mean, it's nice if you can be there for the Sacrament of Holy Unction, but... We'll have unction in that evening. We'll, ha we'll be anointing as many people as come for the, du for the duration of the week. Um, mm, uh, there, the, uh, there's going to be uh, a fish dinner today because it's a feast day. Um, and this is, you know, this is the, the, the way. I know people say, oh, it's still Lent. No, it's not really Lent. F Lent ended Friday. Today is a feast day. And tomorrow begins a much stricter fast of Holy Week. So we didn't end fasting. We are just transitioning through a feast day into Holy Week. That's why, that's why there's fish allowed and not lamb and all the rest of these things that we're going to have towards the end of the week um, or at the end of the week. Uh, and one other thing, just in case I, in case I miss it, um, this year, because Pascha is May 5th, any person that is celebrating um, for St. George, their feast day for St. George, if your old calendar, new calendar... Um, you are celebrating on the same day because Old Calendar uh, St. George is actually May 6th, but we can't celebrate St. George. He's too big of a saint to celebrate during, um, uh, during Lent. So we move his feast to Bright Monday. So Bright Monday is May 6th, Old Calendar, New Calendar. We will be at St. George Massillon uh, on Monday morning. So that will be, if you count Friday, that will be the 10th day out of 11 for Divine Liturgies. It's going to be an awesome time. Please uh, take advantage of most of, of all of it. Um, I did say last, I, I lied, there's one more thing. Um, at, the, at the back of the church, if you are uh, a regular attendee, or if not, if you want to attend the Agape Vesper service, which will be at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, not a liturgy because we will have done the liturgy at midnight. Um, the Agape Vesper service is the only time in the church that a lay person, a non-ordained individual, can read the gospel. It's the only time. But the only prerequisite is that you have to know a foreign language. Okay? That's, you just have to know how to read a foreign language. So if you, uh, we have uh, currently the languages that we have covered are biblical, biblical Greek, Arabic, modern Greek, um, uh, uh, Italian, um, I, I believe Romanian. You, you'll see the list. You'll see the ones that are covered. And then there's a list of the, the languages that we're hoping to get. French, Spanish. Uh, there's somebody that normally reads Turkish. Um, and uh, German. Uh, you know, those, kind of, those kinds of uh, languages. So if you know another language beyond what's there, write it down. Portuguese, whatever those things. Add your name to the list. And you can read the gospel next Sunday, a week from today. So this, it is a, it's a beautiful and wonderful thing if you know how to do that. Um, we are doing this to spread the gospel to all languages and all countries. It's a wonderful thing to do. So um, is there anything else to announce? Yes. Yeah, I announced it last week. Oh, were you here? You were here. Yeah, I announced it last week. Agapate elilus. Yeah. Well, um, so... Uh, so with that in mind, we have the fish dinner. I'll ask you to please rise and we'll bless the food.